Okay, are you ready for the mystery speaker? <laughs> Sorry, he couldn't make it, so I'm going to give another long talk <laughs> about Lincoln. <laughs> well, I'm going to give you a few hints here. Uh, don't shout out who you think it is. This is not bingo night at the VFW <laughs> hall. So I'm going to give you some, a few hints, and hopefully it'll be a little entertaining. I first met our mystery speaker in 1983 when he interviewed me in a cable TV show he had about my very first book, Underground Government, the Off-Budget Public Sector. He's been studying Austrian economics longer than anyone in the building, he spread the ideas of Austrian economics to more people than anyone in this building. A Wall Street insider wrote, once wrote in the Wall Street Journal that he was responsible for the real estate crash and the Great Recession of 2008. He once hit a home run in a major league ballpark. He was once loudly booed by thousands of evangelical Christians for saying Jesus Christ is the Prince of Peace. He's not a left winger, but when he shows up on college campuses, he's wildly cheered. He's written nine books. <clears throat> They're all for sale downstairs. There's serious talk online now that this person would be the, a perfect candidate for Treasury Secretary in the next Trump administration. And finally, he has delivered more than 4,000 babies, and Lou Rockwell once called him the greatest living American. Please welcome Dr. Ron Paul. <laughs> Sounds like a friendly crowd. <laughs> I've been here before, but boy, this is really a delight. <laughs> so uh, I, I'm, I'm delighted to be here. I've been here a couple times before, and uh, it's been that I've worked with Lou Rockwell. You know, you know that Lou Rockwell. Where is he anyway? Right there. Okay. Well, w wonderful, and uh, Lou and I have worked together a long time. Matter of fact, uh, Lou had a lot uh, to do with uh, uh, me getting started in Congress. Lou says he never votes, doesn't like it, and it's uh, always pointing out the truth about, you know, the shortcomings of, of politics. But there are a few things you have to admit to. He was on the payroll of the federal government when he was helping me in my, in my congressional office. But that was a congressional authority. That was okay. But also, he, was, he got involved in a campaign once, and I was just really surprised. You know, I was in the Congress uh, a short period of time in 76. It was a total fluke because uh, I didn't know you could get elected if you just uh, put your name on the list. Anyway, that didn't last long. And uh, then I went back in in 78, and I was there for four more terms. So, but about that time, after, after five, you, you know, you know uh, four or five uh, ter terms there, I, I was sick and tired of the nonsense, and I was missing my medical practice, and I also had bills to pay, things like that. And uh, so I, um, I decided in, uh, 80, uh, in 96 uh, to, to run again. And it, it was interesting because, uh, you know, when I announced, I went and I was a diplomat about this. I went to the Republican delegation, which when I was in Congress first, there were only three Republicans in Texas. Uh, but I went to the delegation, which was much bigger, just to say that this is what I'm going to do. And there was a Democrat that was a congressman uh, in, in my where the district I lived in. So I wanted to tell him, I, you know, I said, you know what? I, because they were always counting votes. I said, you, you know, I think I can turn this district into a Republican district. And they were very polite. And they said, oh, well, yeah, that's good. They shook their head. And about a week later, the district became Republican. They went and bribed the Democrat to do it. They did, gave him everything. 
They gave him, you know, a seat on Ways and Means Committee. Uh, they promised him to raise all this money. They had, uh, you know, about 90 Republican congressmen endorse him and give him money. <laughs> and uh, so they, they figured that, uh, you, you know, we have to keep this guy out. But it was a tough campaign to shorten this little story uh, because by that time I had to run against a Republican and, uh, and, and uh, not the Democrats, so I lost that trail. So I, um, you know, we got into a campaign, the primary was going better than I have ever anticipated, but uh, Lou, Lou came over, he became a volunteer, can you believe that? <laughs> he came a volunteer to come over and help me out on this thing. And, uh, but, but, but it was a very narrow campaign, you had to target your efforts to go to the Republican primary voters. So you look at all the precincts and pick them out. So we found the one that wasn't too far from where I live that was the largest Republican district. So because we had uh, you, you know, a competition in the Republican primary, which was the incumbent. And uh, I remember that we went out and uh, we were campaigning. The one thing was the final thing was the last day, the day of the election. So we'd go out very early, if the polls were open at seven and to seven, something like that. So Lou went with me, came with me to the one. He stood the whole day in campaign there. So then I had to blame him for getting me reelected because he worked so hard. <laughs> but uh, when I started, uh, <clears throat> I never had a decision that I made to myself and say, you know, I think I'd like to be in Congress. What happened was I got fascinated with uh, Austrian economics. Uh, uh, I didn't have the opportunity of going to Tom, uh, Tom's classes and learn his stuff early on, but uh, I was trying to catch up. So I, uh, I was uh, getting to do this. Uh, so I decided after I had a decent understanding of Austrian economics, guess what happened? I bet you, I hope, most of the people in this uh, room know this date. If you don't, remember this date, August 15th, 1971. It's a big day in monetary history. It was the declaration of our bankruptcy. And it was a monetary bankruptcy, and it, it was very, very interesting. That was when Nixon you know, closed the gold window and said, we're not gonna link our dollar to gold. And, put on tariffs. It was just, just a horrible, horrible thing. And I remember Sunday night, I was listening to the news, and Nixon came on with his emergency speech. And uh, the next day, I remember, because I was uh, a member of the Chamber of Commerce and on a, com a legislative committee, and we were having our luncheon then, and they always sent down a national message from the headquarters of uh, way, uh, of uh, uh, the headquarters of the company. The, so they sent it down uh, from uh, from headquarters from the Chamber of Commerce, and they read it, and they were fully delighted with everything. It was just wonderful. And the stock market went up that day at historic levels, the highest they'd ever been before, and uh, this that. This really, this really got my attention. You know, I think it was the worst day in the world, is the way I interpret it, for monetary policy. At the same time, you know, the Chamber of Commerce, they know all about business, and they know about freedom and all this, and they love it. So I said, there's, there's, a, there's a problem here. <laughs> there is a problem here. So it fascinated me, and I found it very interesting. I was fascinated with monetary policy. Came across as some fellow by the name of Murray Rothbard. <laughs> Read a little bit of that, and that fascinated me. So I thought, well, I need to talk about this. So I did the polite thing, and I, man, I was very cautious of protecting my marriage. Uh, I uh, went to my wife, Carol. I told her, I said, you know, I'm gonna run for Congress. She said, what? And <laughs> what are you gonna do that for? I said, well, you know, uh, I, 
I, I, I don't like what's happening. I want to speak out. And nobody, it was 1974 when that was happening, uh, when I told her that. And uh, she, she, when I told her that, she says, uh, no, this, this is a very, very dangerous you know, to, thing to do. Uh, she says, I said, what's dangerous about it? I'm just going to speak out. And she said, well, the danger is you're going to get elected. <laughs> And she admitted she didn't know anything about politics, and I knew I didn't know anything about politics, so I worked on that assumption. But guess what? I was every bit as enthusiastic as ever because I had a podium, and I was getting something off my chest. I, I wasn't lucky enough or smart enough to be a professor, you know, and, and be able to teach. And you, so so I, uh, I, I did this, I, I did it, and I... Uh, uh, Went to, uh, went to went on with this and and finally she says uh, I said why well, why why would this be dangerous and she said we well, you're you're going to be elected I said I can't get elected I mean that's that's not it I want to get the message out and I I can't uh, I, I'm I'm can, no, nobody's going to vote for somebody who wants to get rid of Santa Claus. <laughs> And uh, that's somebody else's job. That, that'll uh, self-destruct someday. But uh, I said, now, uh, they're not going to vote for me. But to my surprise, I had to tell Carol <laughs> her, her perceptions were right. And I, t I, t I didn't take all the credit. I, took, I gave all the credit to the importance of the libertarian message and Austrian economics. And that's why I'm delighted to have spent time uh, with Lou over the many, many years uh, trying to promote the cause. He was uh, working in the congressional office at that time, and uh, he came to me, uh, probably 81 or 82, uh, and he had this idea. I said, it's a great idea. You, you, you go do it. And he says, well, he says, I need to get one little start here. He says, if you, you, I had by that time accumulated a couple names. Back then, we didn't have computers. We had lists. <laughs> a list was very valuable. So I said, yeah. He says, maybe we could send a letter out uh, to get you started. And we did, and I agreed to that. And uh, after that, uh, I, 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 I didn't do all that much, but the letter started it, so I always, I always take credit that I helped Lou get started because I wanted a little bit of this credit, but it was Lou Rockwell that started it and carried this out, so that's the reason that I've worked with Lou for all these years. But there's been m many ups and downs, uh, you know, and <clears throat> I, uh, after I went back, it was in eight, uh, 96, so I st started in 97 and stayed there until uh, 2013. And uh, people said, people, the, the question I get asked the most is, uh, well, uh, how did you put up with this? You knew, you knew better, and, uh, and the people you work with, you know, they weren't very nice people, you know. And I said, well, uh, I, 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 my approach was that, uh, you know, I would deal on a different level with the people in Congress, and that was mainly be polite because I'd rather get along with people than fight with people. I didn't like yelling at people and all the nonsense with non. And I didn't have to worry about lobbyists. They never came to me because I was a lost cause. It's, <laughs> so I, uh, I, I did, did that. And that, that uh, to me was just, uh, uh, the whole thing was to get the message out. And like winning Congress was a surprise. And uh, I'll tell you what, over the years, I was pleasantly surprised very often because I, had, I was uh, uh, very interested in Leonard Reed and the Foundation for Economic Education as, uh, as Lou was. Lou and I, were, we were on the board for a short period of time. Uh, I, I, Fee and Hans Sentholz was the chairman at, at the time. And uh, I, I think that... Uh, the, 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 the one, one thing was that uh, uh, Leonard Reed always emphasized the fact of, of the message that you had. He, he liked educational groups like this. He, uh, 
and, and he had a lot of good advice about campaigning and getting along. He too wasn't super and charged up by politicians, but he he did have me there as frequently as we could do. We got together. So it isn't politics; it's what you believe in that makes the difference. But uh, so, some people some people accuse me in in in. Uh, uh, in campaigning that I was not enthusiastic. I wouldn't do the things you have to do to win. And uh, I said, well, uh, you know, my effort was, uh, it, 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 they were right. That was not my goal was to be a congressman, you know, and have power and become the chairman of the banking committee. I had no thought for that. That was sort of annoying to think about. It. So what I what I wanted to do was just to, you know, continue the process of, uh, of reaching out to people. And that always surprised me that uh, the, the, this this worked. And the one thing uh, Leonard Reed would say, he says, uh, because I've been asked this question many, many times, and uh, and so many of you probably have already participated, or you know somebody, you know that you come, you deal with the Mises Institute, you learn things, and then you have ideas, and you may you combine it, and you might start another organization, and that that is that has happened, you know, so so often, and the people come to me and say, Ron. I really agree with your message. It's limited government. It's great and hard money. And all that. Uh, what should I do? And of course, I get pretty cynical when they ask me. I say, do whatever you want to do. Because <coughs> you, everybody should want to do it and spread this message. Everybody has talent of some sort, just, in, uh, just sincerity and a passive message. <coughs> Leonard Reed said, the most important thing you do is educate yourself. And I understand you do a little educating on these seminars here at the Mises Institute. The Mises Institute has been dedicated, you know, to uh, education. And I still believe absolutely that that is the answer that uh, we have to educate. The destruction has come from uh, education, bad education. I wrote a little pamphlet uh, called, uh, the, you know, a, a the, the surreptitious coup, how, how the progressives and the monsters took over, and uh, the, uh, the people who uh, you know, believed in the Constitution, a limited government, natural law, all these things, uh, they've been pushed aside. But the, <clears throat> the thing of it is, uh, the, the, uh, <clears throat> the message, uh, Leonard Reed said, if you do, if you're educated, as you're getting now, that uh, you will, <clears throat> people will finally, they'll come to you. You don't, have, you don't have to answer that question right now. What are you gonna do? Because there's a, a lot of different people here, but everybody should be thinking about how am I gonna contribute to the, to the world events that go on in our lifetime. And, uh, and, and you don't know exactly, some of you may already have that idea, what you would like to do. Uh, some people become professors and they teach a lot of people, and that's fantastic. And uh, I, was, I think I was frustrated because uh, I was in medicine, and you can practice a lot of good things in medicine and uh, uh, good qualities, and you want to do that. But the, the message uh, is, uh, is something that, uh, you, you know, is very, very important. He said, the people will come to you. And that is true. If you, if you have knowledge and you're doing it, even if you don't have a big organization, but uh, I still spend a lot of time, <clears throat> I figure, that uh, my effort today is uh, mainly trying to learn more. Excuse me. And that is, uh, of course, with Daniel McAdams, we have the Liberty, uh, uh, the Liberty Program, uh, Liberty Report, and we spend time. We don't have a huge research staff. Uh, we we have we have Daniel and I gabbing away, and uh, and we come up with a, a program on current events and economics and a lot of foreign policy. So uh, that, but I think continuing this is very important. <clears throat> but one, but one uh, uh, one or two episodes 
uh, have occurred in the Congress when I was following these rules. <clears throat> I would have a person come down, come to me and uh, say, why did you vote, vote that way? I remember a, a month or two uh, I was in office and uh, there were two of us vote, voted against some, uh, what they would call a liberal bill, and I voted with one of the Burtons. And I don't know if anybody remember the Burtons from California, but they, they were real uh, in the conventional sense, liberal, you know. And, but uh, Bur this, this Burton was uh, a progressive, and we did agree on, on the issues, but he was dumbfounded. He, he, he was dumbfounded. He came here, Ron, what are you doing? <laughs> you know? So I explained that to him, and he became, you, you know, a, a friend. I had another episode where uh, uh, there, was, um, there was a congressman, I think it was from New York. Uh, he was from a very wealthy family, and uh, he was on the, uh, on the committee, uh, the Foreign Policy Committee. And uh, he, he gave a special order after the session. It was... Uh, you know, you can get a one minute, five minutes, sometimes an hour. But he did a short uh, special order, which means he gets to talk about anything he wants. And I can't remember the issue, but I liked it. But I saw an opportunity, too. I want to tell him because I, he was on the committee. I knew him to say hello. He seemed to be friendly, uh, but I never worked with him. So I, I called him up, uh, and he wasn't available for the phone, you know. So I left a message. But the next day, uh, we met in Congress, and uh, we were milling around the floor, a lot of people. And all of a sudden, Amo Houghton, Houghton came up to me. And uh, he said, you called me. What did you want? He was very, uh, very curious about it. And I said, you know, I heard your special order last night. So he probably had me stereotyped, you know, what's this guy talking about? I said, you really did a great job on this. And I thought, it was and it was a, the beginning of a wonderful friendship. And we, and, and interesting enough, later on, uh, there were six Republicans, three were, were in the conventional sense liberals, and then there were three conservative libertarians. But he was one of the, the liberals that voted against going to war in Iraq. And that was, that was a big deal because, uh, you know, I, I think Jim Leach was one of them. It's a mixture, but, uh, but just that outreach uh, made it all difference because uh, we, we became close friends uh, uh, over that. But you know, that, that is a, one thing that can be done. People will c come to you if, uh, if, if the approach is right. And uh, the, the one thing that I know, and most people with common sense know, you can't convert people if you're yelling and screaming and criticize them. Uh, even though I don't follow this rule, absolutely, I try to. And that is when I'm complaining about what's going on in Congress, I really don't like to even name anybody. I want them to think about the issue. Uh, so, I, and I did that over the years. And I think you have more credibility in thinking about the right thing. You don't want to think about the personality because that, that's what ends up in the kind of politics that we have today. It's just personalities and who's lying. It's a tough job today finding out who the biggest liar is. That's the problem with people keep figuring it out. So that, that, that is the big problem that, that we face. And <clears throat> my little pamphlet yeah, deals a little bit with, uh, with this issue of, of lying because I, I think it's been uh, not, not uh, uh, an, an, an old issue or since our Constitution. I think it was there at the beginning of time. Uh, you know, the search for truth, the understanding of natural, natural, na natural law and, uh, and, and, and what really makes the world tick. And, uh, and, and this, uh, this seeking, uh, we're, we're at a climactic, we're getting close to a climactic end to this because the, the people who tell the lies, <clears throat> it finally dawned on me because I've met them and had to deal with them. Uh, that they, uh, they don't say, here, I want to tell you something. It's a lie, but I'm going to tell you something. They just lie through their teeth. They have no shame. And <clears throat> I believe they are nihilists <clears throat> because they, they say that <clears throat> they believe that you cannot know the truth. And uh, they work on that assumption. 
And uh, this makes it difficult because really you have to sort it out who's telling the truth or not. And the one thing that I decided after being in Congress for a few years is when the government has a problem, somebody's been assassinated, and the people want to know what's going on. And uh, the most visited episode of that to me was when I, it was in 1962, uh, I was uh, not in the, in the Congress, uh, but uh, I was, uh, in, in 1960, no, I was in the, in the military. I was in the Air Force at the time. And, uh, I was drafted in 1962, but 1963 uh, is, is the time of the assass assassination. And uh, of course, immediately, you know, a totally independent minded li liberty lover, LBJ, <laughs> <laughs> he says, we need a commission. We got to tell the people, find out, <clears throat> to let the people know what's going on. So they set up a commission, and uh, a few of them had to hide their, uh, in a, uh, their uh, lack of ability to do anything. They made all the mistakes. And then there's a few others that had to cover up their cotton picking lion and evil, the ones that participated in it. I have happened to, and this is still up for discussion for some people, but I've, after all these years, I've decided that I think we're uh, pretty close to saying the CIA was very much involved. <laughs> so, so the CIA, CIA was involved, but when they set up the commission, they had to have a good commission to convince the people. Uh, so, uh, <clears throat> The, the CIA, uh, they, the, the appointment was being made congressional. And uh, they appointed to the committee, uh, you, 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 you know, Rich, uh, 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 sorry, I'll think of his name right, right off the bat, but uh, the CIA agent that did all the planning for the assassination, Alan, Alan. Dulles. What? Yeah, Dulles, Dulles, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the Dulles brothers uh, have a good history to read about, too. So Alan Dulles was the, the kingmaker, and I really, I really believe that. And he was, he was of course, fired by, fired by uh, uh, Kennedy, and there was resentment there. So uh, Alan Dulles was appointed to the commission. So he, can you expect anything from that? That was, that was really a clincher. So uh, that was... Uh, my uh, real introduction to uh, concluding that be wary of any commission set up by government. The motivation, believe me, cannot be well motivated. At least so far, and some people who participate aren't all bad people, but sometimes they put a good person on just to pretend. <clears throat> but uh, it, it's, it's, uh, it's being done all the time, and the commission, <clears throat> The big thing I learned there was you don't trust co commissions. That, that does not get you to the bottom of things. So, <clears throat> and uh, over, over the years, there were a few things that, uh, you know, st stood out uh, and changed my attitude. When, when I went to Congress, I thought, uh, I thought this thing of, you know, welfare is terrible. All these people on food stamps, they probably don't even need to qualify. So I was, I knew it wasn't constitutional, but I concentrated more on that. After I got to Congress, after a little bit, I got on Foreign Policy Committee that the, that the, real, uh, <clears throat> the real welfare goes to the military industrial complex, the pharmaceutical industrial complex, the medical industrial complex, and the poor people are really the victims of all this stuff. So that, <clears throat> that was an eye opener for me. I uh, did become more fascinated with foreign policy, monetary policy and economics drove me into getting things off my chest and getting, uh, getting more attention than I ever dreamed or I ever even thought I deserved, but anyway, it happened. So it was, uh, it was uh, something that uh, you know, just came about. But then I got interested mainly because uh, of the assassinations and different things. That, uh, early on, I uh, started requesting you know, uh, a seat on the Foreign Policy Committee. And they always denied it to me. And finally, the Republican leadership in Texas, since I didn't yell and scream and, 
uh, uh, do a lot of things. They said, maybe we have to throw Ron a bone because he, he can't do all that much harm with foreign policy. And it wasn't like ways and means where he'd be voting against all this stuff. It was, uh, so, so they put me on, uh, for, uh, on foreign policy. And I can remember about six months after that, there was a vote and uh, there was uh, something to do with this country in the Middle East, I think it's Israel. <laughs> and I voted against it, and that made me a bad, bad person. And I can remember the congressman from Texas who was my intermediary to get me on a committee. Oh, he came to me. He wasn't being very polite. He says, after all we did for you, we get you on the committee, and you don't do what we tell you. <laughs> so that's, that's the way the system works. So uh, I... Uh, I, I uh, you know, got more fascinated. <clears throat> then the Middle East came up. When the Republicans got in, it got much worse, and the spending got worse. But they, they, uh, uh, that, the whole, the whole thing is, is uh, the effort was, uh, you know, very much designed to protect the special interests and the power struggle in Washington. And that's what you have to deal with, and that's going to be there, and it's going to continue. But the big, the big thing is, is who's going to compete with the, uh, who's going to pe compete with the nihilists? Well, everybody should be, and I think the numbers are way in favor of the number of people in this country who detest what's going on. But uh, I think the uh, opposition, uh, maybe Soros has something to do with this, the opposition really shrewd, very wealthy, and they have built an empire within an empire, and they have brought about the coup. Because when you think of the Department of Justice, we don't have one. If you think of private practice medicine, we don't have that. And on and on. And, uh, but the worst thing that's happening now <clears throat> is how he was able to plant people in the lower office, judicial offices, and, and on, and, and a lot in the higher office as well. And uh, so that has all been changed because I think that that is destructive. But I think people are waking up on this. And I think there have been so many atrocious things brought about with legislation and all this crazy stuff. And, uh, and, and, and when you think about, uh, you, you know, what, uh, what kind of things were that uh, even Trump, uh, which I am not necessarily a champion of, but can you think of all the things he's been charged with? He was an awfully bad guy. He was convicted of all these fel felonies. But you know what? After it was over the top, the American people didn't believe it. They were rewarding him, you know? So there's a, there's a limit to all this, and I think that's what we're in. It's a mix. There's a lot of bad people <clears throat> in, the, in the in powerful places they, they control, and they're part of the deep state. They make sure who gets appointed to the Federal Reserve and this sort of thing. But there's a lot more people on our side because of the efforts of groups like the Mises Institute and others, and you'll be part of that where you'll have an opportunity to influence some people. And uh, so that, that is it. But Mises has a quote in Human Action that essentially this, there will always be a need for the academicians who write, you know, theoretical and fancy literature to explain things. But he says there's, there's also a group of people that uh, uh, are, are going to be available, and, uh, he, and he used the word, their job is to make the message palatable so the common person understand it. Because in my mind, you still have to deal with a prevailing attitude. Is, the, is it gonna be prevailing attitude endorsing communism or uh, Keynesianism or liberty? So it's very, very important that, uh, that we, we do this. But we need both. We need the academicians. And I, I, think, uh, I think we've had some very good uh, effort to produce the information that you need. It's available. In campaigning, <clears throat> when we'd get into a campaign like, uh, like I was in the presidential race, they would ask questions. I say, well, if you want to follow up on this, get hold, look up the Mises Institute, and you'll, you'll find the answer, you'll find the books, and uh, it's, it'll be reasonable in charge. And, uh, <clears throat> and I, I so strongly believe that. But uh, I hope 
that I was able to make the message palatable where people could get excited about it. The one thing is, is, you know, somebody said, you, you know, you mean like uh, in the Fed? I said, well, that, that's interesting. I, I don't know who started that, but uh, I was in a debate in uh, Detroit, but went over to, over to Ann Arbor uh, for, for a rally. It was a pretty big rally outdoors, and they said, well, this is a liberal campus, you know that. <laughs> so when I arrived, it was a little late because of the debates, <clears throat> but uh, two things happened there. They started chanting in the Fed, and I didn't tell them to. I didn't write it or anything. Else. <laughs> and and the Fed, and uh, also they really broke the law. And I had to be careful about this. They took out Federal Reserve notes and burned them. <laughs> so maybe one dollar bills. I don't know. <laughs> but no, that was an eye opener for me. And a delight. And uh, so it has been. Uh, so somebody asked me, uh, you know, where, where, do you, where do you get your energy? And uh, I said, well, the message is my energy because I'm really enthused. That's the very first thing I did when it dawned on me and, it put, and the light bulb went on. And I thought, you know, this is an important message, you know. This answers a lot of questions. So I'd like to get it off my chest and talk about it. But uh, also, it is... Uh, it is something that uh, is, is necessary, important, and I like to make people a little uncomfortable. Because if you've arrived at that point, and many of you already have, to this point where you know the message and you'd like to do something about it, and uh, the guilt, I want to put a guilt trip on you. If you don't do it, you're going to be upset with yourself because you have a responsibility. You have more responsibility than the millions of people that never even heard of Austrian economics. So you'll have this. You'll have something to offer. And that's, that, to me, puts the burden on you. And, of course, I'm just being a, a little bit silly about a guilt trip, but an uncomfortable guilt, an uncomfortable feeling that, you know, maybe I could do more. And I, I know one thing, in a group like that, there is going to be so many creative ideas, and we have already run into them. Daniel's been with me and, and uh, has been, uh, uh, does a lot of work on foreign policy. We already have bumped into a lot of people who have started their own group. With a, so many of them have websites, and, and that's been an eye-opener. The podcasts or something else. And uh, the other day I said, oh, how many people listen to our live, uh, live podcast? Podcast today, our numbers aren't that great, but significant. I said, "Well, it's quality we're after." But then somebody went, and uh, maybe Daniel did this. He went. He he knew I was wondering about numbers, so he went and looked at everything audio, the different people who rebroadcast. He says, "There's a lot of people listening." There's a lot of people want to hear it, and there's a, not enough people to spread the message. But everybody has a job. It's going to be different. And um, <clears throat> the most important thing is you do something you like and enjoy. I come to these conferences like this because I enjoy it. And I get, uh, I get feedback and I get enthusiastic because of people like you that care about it. So guess what? I'm an optimist. In spite of the fact that most of my speeches are 75, 80%, all warning people, this is a disaster, do something, that I also, I also know that they're out there. There's always a remnant. There is a great remnant out there. And I said, maybe I can feed a little bit into the remnant of that group of people who know what the truth is. And that is why I feel very good that I was invited here to spread the message and share that message with you. Thank you. Sure do. Paul, would be happy to take some questions if you have any. Uh, what role did your faith play in your political career? Faith. Well, <clears throat> I'm a strong believer, and I, I think that my background in it played a major role in it because I keep thinking, uh, this is rather simplistic, but, you know, even on racial things and some things that could be controversial, I think, you know, I think I heard that in Sunday school, <laughs> you know. So it has been a, a, a big, big influence. And now 
I don't, uh, sometimes I use it as, uh, I don't carry it on my sleeve because I think of the evangelicals on TV. So, but it, it has a strong uh, effect on me. And, I, and I, I like to think about and look at history of natural law. And all of a sudden, you know, they're the ones who want to know the truth. And natural law has been around, I think, from the beginning of time, you know, all the way back to Adam and Eve. They were talking about natural law. And, uh, and, and this, this is the thing. I, I had a friend, a well-known libertarian writer, and uh, he would always, you know, sort of a friendly challenged me all the time, are you a Christian? Are you still a Christian? And this sort of thing. And, uh, uh, but I caught him in, in an accident speech because he, he, was, he was talking about Hillary. And he says, you know, that woman is terrible. She has no shame. <laughs> and I thought, you know, he, he spoke a real message. What does he know about shame? <laughs> I thought, she, shame is knowing the truth. And she was... Yeah, I think he said more than he wanted to admit. <laughs> Another question over here. Uh, how did you first uh, meet uh, Murray Rothbard? Well, <clears throat> I know one, uh, one of the very, very earliest times when, uh, when we were working on the Gold Commission and Lou and I both uh, knew Murray very well. I had... I uh, may have met him. I think I probably met him, but didn't know him. But when the Gold Commission started, we decided, well, well, why don't we get Murray here? And Lou, I think, had met him, but he, they weren't as close friends as when they were doing the RRR, you know, this sort of thing over the years. But so Murray came, Mur Murray came in, uh, and that's when we really set, set up a relationship. And I can remember... Uh, uh, Murray being amazed that he never he looked around and looked at some of some of the pictures and some of the books I had he says I never thought I'd see this stuff in a in a congressman's office see I didn't have pictures of I had pictures of uh, Austrian economists <laughs> I didn't have pictures of politicians so that was when I really started and and he helped obviously to do some the research on uh, on the uh, case for gold which was the uh, uh, you, you know, the uh, report for the mi minority report, because there were only two. Uh, I, I was, you know, getting it written and researched, but uh, I, I had to work hard to get one more person to agree. <laughs> okay. What If there was a one single policy thing that you think libertarians should be focused on right now, what would it be? Oh, I, I, know, I know the one, but it's going to be much broader than he wants. Liberty. <laughs> <laughs> You know, uh, so I had a, somebody come up to me once and, you know, I took the position that, you know, I thought the drug war was not all that productive. So uh, early on, I have a Bible, had a Bible uh, belt, congressional district, and I took that position. And so he said, <laughs> you're not going to be here very long. And uh, I, I, I did that. And uh Somebody came up to me once and said, are you the congressman that wants to legalize marijuana? <clears throat> I said, no, that's not, I don't want to legalize marijuana. Where'd you get that nonsense? I says, I want to legalize liberty and let people make up their own minds about it. So uh, that to me is a big, big difference. If, I say, if you go, uh, matter of fact, it was strategy as well as anything because I really didn't care about marijuana. I don't like drugs and, I, I, and all of this. So I'm not in the, in the business of legalizing a substance like that, but I want to legalize freedom of choice. And uh, that, that, that to me is the most important a choice, voluntarism. Some of these words carry a lot of weight if you apply it across the board. I, I saw you last week at the Nashville Bitcoin conference. I was wondering what your thoughts were on that event. Well, I, I was uh, very impressed. Quite a few people there, thousands of people there. And uh, the, the one thing is, is there were a lot of friends there. A lot of people claimed, they said, well, you've influenced me and this is why I'm here. But uh, when people invite me to crypto 
meetings, and I've been going to them for a long time, I always, I always give them a fair warning. I said, you know what my position is. I don't own crypto. I don't tell people to buy crypto, and uh, I'm not sure what's going to happen to it. And uh, I said, I just give this message I more or less gave here that uh, it's big government, it's liberty, and this sort of thing. But I would talk a lot about the financial crisis coming and the dollar, and I'd talk about the Fed and all this. But it fit into a scenario that, uh, because I was for, you, you know, uh, repealing legal tenor laws and, uh, you, you, and, and you know, letting people pick and choose what they want in a free society. So, uh, and, and they always took that disclaimer. So I, I go there, but there were a large crowd there. I've just, uh, I'm just not really concerned, but I'm just understanding it because so many people came up and said, you started all this, this is all this wonderful. But I think they make a leap <laughs> to, to the point that that was an endorsement. It's an endorsement once of the idea of liberty, not an endorsement of marijuana. And, <clears throat> and there's, a, there's a big difference. And, <clears throat> and I, I uh, you know, <clears throat> they, they'd, uh, I, I just, uh, I, I was fascinated with the meeting. I was fascinated. There were a lot of supporters there. Uh, and, but, but it was a, another time I emphasized that uh, words are important, you know. And if they did, if somebody was really, really, and there may be somebody in this room that were really, really super uh, supportive of uh, Bitcoin, you might not want to hear this choice business. But uh, uh, that, that, that's not it. I, I don't want to even get into that because if, if, if I had to explain uh, the, uh, the, the, the details of the, the, of the process, how you, how, you mine, <laughs> how you mine this stuff, and it's amazing. You mine Bitcoin and, and you can see pictures of it. It looks like a gold coin, and that's Bitcoin. Oh, that must, must be a good deal. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, I have a question, please. Um, what is your an analysis about the future of libertarianism in the Western world, and in particular in Europe, please? Well, libertarian per se in Europe, I wouldn't know enough. I would not be overly optimistic. I think the opposition, <laughs> I think the op the uh, uh, the, the, the opposition is building, but I think it's disseminated. I mean, in this room, you could say, boy, libertarianism alive and well. <clears throat> the prevailing attitude is liberty. <clears throat> but then we wouldn't be true to ourselves because it isn't. So uh, <clears throat> I don't know Europe, I imagine. I, I, <clears throat> you know, I, I made only one trip during Congress uh, overseas. And I went to uh, Czech, Czech Republic, and uh, I was invited, and uh, by a private source, the university there, they wanted me to uh, help celebrate uh, human action translation in the Czech. And I thought that sounds like something I'd like to do. So, so I went, and uh, <laughs> trying to go there, it was more trouble allowing me to go there with the congressional rules. Uh, because I wasn't taking government money. <laughs> they, they, <clears throat> there was a little more red tape. But if I'd have just, you know, hooked up and worked it out with a deal, I was on foreign policy, and that's why you're on that committee, is you get to fly. <laughs> so it, it, uh, it was, uh, it, it was uh, something that uh, we, we were not, <laughs> you know, pretty surprised with. <clears throat> My name is Elizabeth Stump, and my question is, how do we get the bad people out of power when they are the ones that are choosing who gets the power next? Oh, that's right. That's about the Department of Justice. It's, <clears throat> it's all education, a prevailing attitude, <clears throat> and more people. You, you know, you might look at crypto or the, uh, uh, COVID. All the bad people were in charge. They did a lot of harm, but eventually, People woke up because even though there might have been 10% of the doctors speaking the truth, they always suck. Right now, they're the heroes because they stood up to it. It has to be ideological. You can't, you can't say, well, they're, they're tough and they do all these kind of things. So it's, it's to me, never violence. It has to always be competitive uh, because we have, the, 
we have the best philosophy. Yeah, how, how can we lose it? Why, why don't we have a better argument to, that would have kept them from it? And you have to understand, you know, there's been a selfish desire by people. People thought, that, like I started the whole talk off, was I, I can't get elected, I'm against Santa Claus. And Santa Claus wants to take care of people, and people in the short run, because of their ignorance, uh, will go along with it. So you just have to override that. Uh, the, the, the founders had that job, and they, they never had 100% of the people, even during the war, you know, it was a, a smaller number of people. But it has to be ideological. But ideas have power. You know, and you can't stop a good idea. You have a good idea, but it can't be stopped. It can't come fast enough for you, and uh, that's the whole thing. But it will come, but you can always find a way to participate in that, and that is so important because it is very frustrating, and why do they do that? I sort of, psychologically, I just have a wall there. When, when people are totally out of it, you know, I, I'm not going to waste a lot of energy on it, but I'm going to be disappointed. It makes me work harder to explain why you don't need that. You need, you need, people say, oh, you can't be a libertarian. Nobody would get medical care. And I say, yeah, but what happens if, uh, if nationalized medicine is sort of like the doctor's taking care of COVID and they killed more people than they saved? So it has to be defended with, uh, with, the, with the facts uh, rather than uh, personalizing it. That's, it doesn't work very well for me. <clears throat> Throughout your political career, what do you consider the greatest libertarian success? Boy, I might have to think for a minute. <laughs> well, uh, you know, one, uh, the one that uh, I think has been sig significant has been, uh, well, let me just give it a thought, because it has, there, there have been successes. Uh, well, in economics, it was sort of libertarian-ish, uh, but it was a monetary thing that did make a difference that we don't talk about it. I talked a lot about the stupidity of uh, what happened on August 15th, and, uh, and I didn't mention, but we know what, what uh, Roosevelt did, made gold illegal, but a shift in attitude was coming out of the Gold Commission was finally uh, the re-legalization where that we could buy it. So there, you can be on your gold standard. Right now, if you want to be, you could be on a silver standard. And I, I think that is good. So that's, that's uh, I don't, I don't you, you might have been looking for something else, but uh, there, there, are, there have, been, have been victories that uh, are, are probably more minor, but they add up. To, to me, the victories are the, are, the, are the messages that we hear. I think uh, when I, you know, when I see a group like this, that's, that's one of the victories of, uh, of libertarianism because, uh, you know, and, and Lou's been doing this for years. I wonder, I wonder how many people Lou Rockwell has influenced over the years. I mean, quite a few. And, uh, <clears throat> and the wonderful thing about the story, the biblical story about the remnant, you, you never know exactly where the greatest efforts were made. But an idea whose time has come can't be stopped, and that's encouraging. And it happens probably more at the lower level that the, the ideas change. Just, uh, just uh, there's positive steps that uh, <clears throat> most of the time you can find something positive or uh, sort of daydream and pretend it's positive. <laughs> so, okay. Thank you so much.